Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at our Terrace IP with Kurt Schuler, who's going to talk today about AI training chips in the data center. Kurt, obviously AI is one of the big topics these days, but inside the data center, we've typically been using GPUs and, and CPUs to train these uh, algorithms. What's changed there? Where are we going next? Well, the, one of the big things that is happening today is that people are they're breaking apart the algorithms into um, functional mathematical parts that they're then accelerating with their own specific processing elements or hardware accelerators. I drew this up on the board uh, because I'm a terrible artist, uh, but I'll, I'll describe, you know, uh, picturally what exactly is happening with these big chips. Um, so the first thing to notice is, yes, they're using their own processing elements to do um, this hardware acceleration. Uh, a lot of these are, are mathematical functions. Uh, for example, you, you said before about GPUs, and there's a whole bunch of SIMDs and, and a whole bunch of max multiply accumulates in there, um, single structure multiple data functions, things like that. A lot of matrix math that uh, goes on uh, within a neural net. Um, the other thing that happens is there's huge bandwidth for data flow, and there's a few things I'll talk about about that, but in addition to having wide bandwidth for the data flow, uh, there's also some features that are required to distribute data from one node within um, the neural network processing to multiple nodes simultaneously. And these are generally very large chips that we've been working with, right? Yes, these chips can be really, really huge. What I have up here is you know, the 20 millimeter square chip. Um, and, and we have seen chips this big for this type of functionality. They're in data centers, they got a lot of cooling, they got a lot of processing uh, or um, uh, power uh, supply for that, and a lot of bandwidth going in and out of these different servers. So let's drill down into this a little bit. What exactly is in these chips? So the first thing that you notice in the chips is the custom processing elements. And so what will also be in the chip that I have it shown here is some kind of control element that might be an x86 processor that is attached through PCIe connection, a uh, se separate processor, it might be ARM processors um, within the same die, but there's some kind of control logic that is um, controlling the data flow throughout the system. Now for all these different processing elements, you see here they're connected to a node and that's within a mesh. And these meshes can, can get really, really huge. And the reason they're doing that is because what, as I mentioned before, they're breaking apart within the neural network, they're breaking apart the, the mathematical functions, and they're applying those in a certain order to match what that algorithm is. And so there is communications forward through the neural net and forward through a mesh, but there's also what we call back propagation, there's communications backwards, as well as sometimes uh, temporal data that is stored and reused later within this um, system. So that's why we have a mesh to map those mathematical functions to a hardware element. Is this all east-west type of uh, processing here or does it run north-south here? Um, it's it's north-south, east-west. Um, how things are driven, and I haven't shown these on here, is I mentioned very high bandwidth. That's within the system and the transfer of data through the system. Uh, but also you have off-chip memory. For example, HBM2 is a uh, very, uh, used quite a bit now. Um, also could be um, GDDR6, but what is happening here is these are very wide bandwidth, um, actually in the case of HBM2, it's, it's eight or 16 ports going in here, very, very wide data going into th these um, um, memories. And there's multiple of them. From the chip standpoint, the memory controllers will be on the outside. Uh, when you look at it from a physical standpoint, it'll be stacked. Um, but the point is, is there's a ton of data going through this. So it's a very sophisticated chip. Um, some of the things that are required uh, within these chips are very different than you know, traditional server chips. So how does the data flow here? It, where, where do you actually start seeing the movement? Okay. Well, the movement will come uh, from memory into the system, will be processed, and then will ultimately find its way out into memory, where it will be accessed by the overall system. Now, one of the things that's different about the, the switches uh, within this mesh network as compared to something that you would see in, for example, a digital baseband or a mobile phone or consumer electronics product is that each one of these is a north-south, east-west router. So there's connections into and out of uh, this corner router, 
uh, from all different directions. Another thing that's different is you have um, uh, different initiator and target connections in addition to the north, south, east, west connections to the, to the other routers. So this is the classic matrix multiplication, right? It, it's a classic matrix here. Uh, there's a lot more going on um, besides matrix multi multiplications uh, within the system. What they're trying to do is keep as much of that as possible in memory within the processing elements. But when they start having to share data, they want to have the most efficient ways to do it. Because what's happening in a neural net is like, for example, let's talk about weights. Uh, when you're multiplying weights by a matrix, matrix of um, uh, different neurons, those weights have to be transmitted to all the processing that's going on for those neurons. And if you were to do those serially, it would take too long and it'd be too much data movement. But if you could do those all in parallel, you could really get some huge bandwidth going through the system. So that's what people are doing today. You've got a very large chip here, though. Doesn't that have an impact on timing closure? Uh, yes, it does. And one of the big things that affects time enclosure is how do you get a clock tree uh, distributed and sent across this chip? And you know, you're dealing with skew and things like that. One of the things that people uh, use to deal with this is having source synchronous connections so that the clock is traveling with the data through the chip. And so that makes things easier for the uh, place and route guys on the back end. So another thing that happens in a training chip is you've got memory scattered around the chip, right? It's not just one big memory. There's little memories tied to little processors. That's correct. Each of these processing elements has its own local memory. And the challenge for the SOC and the software architect is to keep as much of the data and instructions in memory within the processing elements without having to go off chip into um, uh, the HBM2 memory. So if you're working with us, what do you have to keep in mind when you're developing all this stuff? It, is this just a standard, uh, you know what you're going to be developing on a chip, or do you really have to think through, this is a completely new architecture, we can make this more efficient? We really have to think this through. For all of our customers who are doing this, it, these architectures are defined by the software requirements. This is totally a software, algorithmically defined hardware architecture. So it's given the algorithms that we're going to use uh, within this neural net training system, what does the hardware have to be to meet our requirements? Do the tools exist? Are they as mature as they are in other areas? Like, for example, when you're developing a chip for a mobile phone, you pretty much know what you're going to get into and what the issues are going to be. Do you necessarily know that when you're getting into this, this world? From a software tooling standpoint, uh, the answer is yes. From a hardware uh, tooling standpoint, the answer is, is sort of. I mentioned the timing issues in the very large chips. This is a big issue. Everybody's working on that. And as we know, uh, as we get into smaller nodes, those issues become more, more and more prevalent. So the physical design guys have a really huge challenge. It's very easy to create a chip that works from a software standpoint and works from a logical hardware standpoint that there'd be no way in heck for the physical design guys to actually place and route the thing. So this is just one of the topologies that you can use in a, uh, an AI chip, right? Aren't there other ones as well? Uh, yes, there are. And this is grossly simplified, of course, but there are not only different topologies, but combinations of topologies. So sometimes you'll see a ring type structure with multiple clusters of processing elements attached to it. Another thing that you'll often see is Tori. So basically, if you think of this as all being connected and folded in on itself, so it's a, a 3D torus type uh, type structure. That's also very common. When you're working off of one processing element of memory and something changes, how does that get broadcast out to all the other different processors and memories? That is where the network on chip interconnect can really help because what you want to be able to do for maximum efficiency. For example, if you've calculated something here in this processing element, and then you want to send it to a whole bunch of other processing elements, let's say it's a, a new calculation of weights, and you want to send it to all, you know, four different processing elements or 40 different processing elements all, the sa all at the same time, you want to be able to do a single write and have that be broadcast or selectively multicast to the um, different processing elements that are to receive it. And so that's a feature that is really helpful within the network on chip interconnect for these types of chips. So we've been at this now for, first of all, with AI we've been at it for a long time, but really with uh, machine-generated algorithms, they've really taken off in probably the past two to three years. 
What will it look like going forward a couple of years from now? What, what will change here? That's really hard to say. There is so much innovation happening right now. And what you're seeing here is a classic. There's, there's no one best way to do this, and everybody's experimenting. And all of the, the sexy attention is on the software side of things. But the people who are going to win in this space are the folks that can create an overall system that can do this quickly and um, uh, at uh, you know, low power and efficiently. And that requires both hardware and software. You could try to do this on a whole bunch of x86s. You could try to do this uh, efficiently uh, just on GPUs. But people are finding that by doing this in their own custom ASICs, they get you know, order magnitude better performance. The number that we've heard is a 100x improvement in performance is what they're striving for. Is that unrealistic? We don't know yet whether that's possible. Um, one of the things that you look at as far as a limiting constraint on the system, you see bandwidth to memory. Uh, eventually you get to a point where you're, you're fighting uh, uh, that issue, and that's similar to what we have with, with just about any electronic system. But we are seeing a lot of innovation on the SOC itself. I think the big challenge will be how big can we get these things and still get decent yield. Kurt Schuller, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you.